Okay, I'll begin reading at verse 18 in Matthew chapter 1, which says this, this is how the birth of Jesus the Messiah came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream. Now, let me pause just for a brief rabbit trail. I know some of you might be joining us for the first time, but the rest of us have just spent uh, the last seven weeks or so studying the character of Joseph in the Old Testament and seeing all the connections, the way that it leads forward to the new. And I'm not gonna spend much time on it, but I think it's important just to help you learn how to read the Bible, but then also because I think there's an important point here too. Uh, I just want you to see the connection between this Joseph and the Joseph in the Old Testament. Uh, first, the easy one, the low-hanging fruit, they share a name. They're both named Joseph. Uh, but not just that, if you look, for instance, in verse 16, you'll see that Joseph has a father, and uh, this Joseph, the one that was the father of Jesus, uh, his father's name was Jacob. And uh, if you're just joining us, this might be Bible trivia, but for everyone else, you know this now. In the Old Testament, the Joseph that we've just been studying, what was his father's name? It was also Jacob. And um, probably one of the first things we learn about Joseph in the Old Testament is that his being led, his life is kind of proceeding on the basis of dreams that he has. And there we just read it in the middle of verse 20, the Lord appeared to him in a dream. If you were to read all of Matthew chapter one and then into Matthew chapter two, uh, Joseph is the lead character here. If you read in Luke's gospel, Mary, the mother of Jesus is the lead character. You don't learn a lot about Joseph. Other than that, he keeps having dreams. So if you look at chapter two, just for a moment, you might page over. You can see that in verse 13, uh, after the Magi come and leave, uh, the Lord appears to Joseph in a dream. And in verse 19, you'll see it again. After Herod dies, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. So both the Joseph of the Old Testament and the Joseph of the New Testament, both dreamers. And uh, you'll recall the Joseph of the Old Testament, he wound up being sold as a slave to where? To Egypt. And uh, you'll see, if you look at verse 13 and what follows in chapter two, that Joseph, after the Lord appears to him a dream, winds up taking Jesus and Mary down to which country? Egypt. And I just want you to see the connections uh, just so that as you're reading, you've become attuned to the little clues that you find in Scripture. And maybe up till now, it's all Bible trivia. Here's why I stopped to make the point. Uh, the Christmas season is filled with, uh, I guess I'll just call it sentimentality. This idea that everything is kind of shiny and perfect. It's all wrapped up with a nice bow on it. And uh, we're supposed to feel happy and joyful. And there's songs singing and, you know children dancing, and everything's supposed to be perfect, but not all of us feel that way. Not everything is perfect. And uh, part of what I just want to point out is we've lost track of the original Christmas story. The original Christmas story was about a young man who was engaged, and the person he was engaged to wound up pregnant, and he knew it wasn't his child. Relationship troubles. And God shows up. And then this baby is born, if you get into chapter two, you'll see that there were people who pursued the baby in order to kill him. He has to escape to Egypt and he's threatened with his life. And here's the point. When life is spinning out of control, and that's what the story of Joseph is in the Old Testament, is a story of life spinning out of control. He's sold off into slavery. He, he winds up in prison. It's just everything's spinning out of control. You'll think to yourself, God must be gone. He must be absent. Or here, when this Joseph finds out the person he's engaged to is pregnant and life is spinning out of control, you might think God's absent, he's gone. There's a point. 
The Bible wants you to realize that even when life seems from our vantage point to be spinning out of control, God's powerfully at work, he's carrying out his plan, and of course the same is true in your life as well. So in case, you know, there's some of us here who are not filled with sentimentality and everything's not picture perfect with, uh, you know, wrapping and a bow on it, uh, I think there's a message that I just wanted to pause to point out. Anyway, back to verse 20. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She'll give birth to a son, and you're to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph awoke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him and took Mary home as his wife. But he did not consummate their marriage until she gave birth to a son, and he gave him the name Jesus. The focus in this passage is on the naming of this Savior. They gave him the name Jesus, which means the Lord saves. But Matthew says that all this fulfills an Old Testament scripture passage, uh, a scripture passage from the book of Isaiah chapter 7, which says that a virgin will conceive and give birth to the son, and they will give him the name Emmanuel, which means God with us. And it's that phrase, God with us, that I'd like to just take time to consider this morning. And three words, so three points. Uh, first point, Jesus is God. The second point, Jesus is God with us. Probably by now you guessed the third point, Jesus is God with us. So we'll take them one at a time. Astounding statement, Jesus is God. So here's a couple, she gives birth to a son, they give him the name Jesus, and I mean, you see this little human baby, there's this amazing statement, Jesus is God. Maybe that sounds so commonplace today, that so familiar that we've lost touch with what that means. I think that we should pause for a moment to think about the fact that the omnipotent, eternal, ever-present creator of the universe, the sun, the moon, the sky, the stars, Jesus is this God. This isn't the only place where statements like this are made in the Bible, Jesus is God. I thought I'd just share a few because the Bible repeats it again and again and again. Astounding claim, Jesus is God. So for instance, John chapter 1 starts this way, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And we'll actually talk about this tonight if you come back, but verse 14 says, the Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us, and we have beheld His glory, the glory of the one and only who came from the Father full of grace and truth. Uh, the Word was God, Jesus was God. Um, in the book of Acts, the Apostle Paul, as he goes about his missionary journeys, he's wrapping up his third missionary journey, and he stops by to visit the Ephesian church, the elders. And he gives them kind of a charge because he doesn't think he's going to see them again. And this is what he says to the Ephesian elders. He, sees, he says, be shepherds of the church of God, which he, God, bought with his own blood. This is an astounding statement. Uh, here's maybe one of my favorites, and the truth of the matter is, I could probably just go on for a full half hour, one scripture passage after the next. This one I, I think is really intriguing because there's a, a dialogue between Jesus and those who are opposed to him, uh, religious leaders among the Jews. And this is how the dialogue goes. It says, the Jews answered him, aren't we right in saying that you're a Samaritan and demon-possessed. Um, probably most of us, if we know anything about the Samaritans, we think they must be good because we know the parable of the good Samaritan. The Jews and Samaritans hated each other. Anyway, and demon-possessed. So these Jews are like, we've seen you, Jesus, and uh, the hocus-pocus you have going on, 
uh, there must be a demon inside of you. And of course, Jesus responds. He says, I'm not possessed by a demon, but I honor my father and you dishonor me. And he says, very truly, I tell you, whoever obeys my word will never see death. And I mean, that statement was just way too much for them to take. So they exclaimed, now we know you're demon possessed. Abraham died, so did all the prophets, and yet you say whoever obeys your word will never taste death. They'd say, who do you think you are? I mean, you must really be full of yourself. You must, I mean, what kind of grandiose statements are you making? And then Jesus responds, he says, if I glorify myself, my glory means nothing. My Father, whom you claim as your God, is the one who glorifies me. Then he says, your father Abraham rejoiced at the thought of seeing my day, he saw it and was glad. And again, this is just way over the top for them. So they say, oh, you're not even 50 years old. And you've seen Abraham? Like, ha, ha, ha. I mean, they're just, they're flabbergasted at these statements he's making. This is the statement I, I really want you to see because it's a statement that Jesus makes and it's astounding. Very truly, I tell you, Jesus answered, before Abraham was born, I am. And if you're not familiar with the Old Testament, you may not know this, but there is an encounter that Moses has at this bush that's burning, a burning bush. When God first called Moses, he sees this bush on fire. He walks over and God calls out from this burning bush, Moses, take off your sandals. The place where you're standing is holy. And he approaches and God says, I'm gonna send you to Egypt, to Pharaoh, and you've gotta tell him, let my people go. And like anyone would, Moses has all these questions. Well, if I'm gonna go do something crazy like that, um, you know, he's got all these questions. He says, one of my questions is, what's your name? So if I go and say, someone spoke to me and said, let my people go, and they say, well, what's the name of the God who told you that? He says, what am I supposed to say? And God answered, and it's, it's really profound. He says, you tell them, I am who I am. That's my name forever, the I am. And of course, Jewish people all through the Old Testament, uh, this was the holy, sacred name of God, the I am. And so when Jesus said, listen, before Abraham was born, I am. He, I mean, there's no mistake. He's claiming to be God in the most clear tones. And just to show you how clear the tones were, it says at this, they picked up stones to stone him. I mean, this was the height of blasphemy for a person to say, I am, I'm the self-existent God of the universe. Um, I mean, up till then they were laughing at him. Now it's just straight out blasphemy. It's too much. Jesus is God. So, I mean, here, I point out that the Bible makes this claim. You have got to spend some time evaluating that. There's no other religion where someone says, I am God. Uh, of course, today, there are many people who, they don't think Jesus is God, they just think he's a wise teacher or someone, you know, that that was a good person. Listen, someone who's going around saying, I am God, if they're not, is not a good person. So I just encourage you to just take some time to figure this out. Why Christians believe that's so important is because that claim is at the heart of the good news that this Bible has, the gospel message. Uh, here at Sunlight, all, all the time, I, I teach people the main message of the Bible, uh, three words, sin, salvation, service. Here's the good news, the main message of the Bible. Uh, first, you know, in order to know the good news, you've got to know the bad news, sin, that all of us are sinners. We don't live up to God's standard. We're constantly committing crimes against Him in our thoughts, words, and deeds. And God's righteous and just. He is totally pure, totally set apart from sin and holy. And so we can't be in His presence. Our sin cuts us off from God, which means death, first spiritual death, finally physical death, and then in the end, eternal death if we're not reconnected to him. 
And there's nothing we can do about it. It doesn't matter how hard we try. It doesn't matter how good we become. Uh, doesn't matter whether we go to church or don't go to church. There's nothing we can do by our own effort to make ourselves fundamentally pleasing to God's sin. Uh, second part of the good news. This is really, if you got that bad news, here's the good news. Salvation. God's loving and merciful. So he provided a substitute, someone to take our place. And there was no other creature that could do the job, so God the Father sent God the Son. And here, this is the meat of it. This is the heart of it. Jesus is the perfect substitute because he's both fully human and fully God. Why that's important, fully human? It's just a principle of justice. Human beings who have sinned must pay for their own sin. You can't look to any other creature to do that. There's a principle of justice. He who does the crime does the time. And so if you're going to look to find a savior, you've got to find someone who's a human being. Uh, it'd be convenient if God could smite all the elephants because we sinned, but that's not just. It's not justice. And so, therefore, whoever your Savior would have to be, has to be, must be a human being. Not just any human being, a, a sinless human being. Uh, this, this Savior could not sin, could not be full of crimes that, that he or she would have to pay themselves. Uh, here, Steve, you're right here with me. Let's just suppose it's the judgment day. I always give this illustration, not always with Steve, but it's a judgment day. And let's just say that uh, judgment has come. And I don't know why at judgment day I always picture this big throne and I, I see us lined up. I don't know that that's how it's gonna actually be, but that's how I picture in my mind. We're lined up one at a time. We're coming forward and as we get into the presence of God, he's kept a record of everything we've done and that gets displayed, every secret thought we've had, every sin we've ever committed. He knows it and, it, and it gets put on display. And every one of us, one at a time, will fall to our knees. And so, at least in my mind in this illustration, Steve's gone first, and uh, he's there on his knees, uh, fearful and afraid because everything he's ever done is exposed. And let's just say throughout life, uh, I've developed such a love for Steve that I'm standing in line and I just can't take it. And so finally, finally I just yell out, God, wait, let me take Steve's place. Uh, I already know what God would say, hey, Scott, get back in line, and you know, I'll deal with you next, <laughs> right? Uh, a sinful human being can't offer to be a substitute, only a sinless human being. But this sinless human being, which is a requirement, must also be God. Here's why, let's turn this illustration back around. Now let's say that I go first. And I've already admitted I'm a sinner, but let's, see that, let's say that Stephen lived a perfect sinless life. Let's just say that. Okay, amen, he says. <laughs> let's just say it. You know, and he's developed such a love for me that he can't take it anymore. And so I'm down on my knees, everything I've ever done, kind of out in the open, and he says, wait. Because he's sinless, God would say, okay, come on up here, Scott. Uh, you know, welcome to paradise, Steve. You know, depart from me. You know, and he'd go away to eternal judgment, paying the price of my sin. And now all of you would be in line, and guess what? You'd have to find your own savior. I mean, I got Steve. You've got to find someone else. Why? Because my sins will keep Steve busy for eternity. Like, I'm just one limited human being. Steve's just one limited human being. Whatever Savior you're looking for can't just merely be human and be sinless. He must also be God, because since Jesus is God, he has this eternal capacity, this dimension, not only to bear the weight of my sin, not only to bear the weight of Steve's sins, but the sin of the whole world. And that's why Jesus is the perfect substitute, because he's God. And of course, what happened, finally, if you read his life, he ultimately went to the cross, and there on the cross, God took my sins, he took Steve's sins, he took all of our sins, he knows every sin we ever have or will commit, he put them on Jesus, and Jesus bore the punishment we were supposed to bear. He died. He took God's wrath and anger for the things we've done. And because he was God, he could take it all. And 
The proof of that's the resurrection. He paid for every last sin. That's salvation, and then finally service. That now the salvation is just held wide open to every single person. You know, if you see, okay, I can't save myself. I need a savior. There's just open arms of God saying, come, grab hold of Jesus, turn away from your own, you know, insistence on saving yourself. Turn to, put your faith in Jesus Christ. And if you do, he'll give you a brand new life, live with and for him for all of eternity. Sin, salvation, service. That's the the main message of the Bible. And um, anyway, why it's important, point number one, Jesus is God. Point number two. Jesus is God with us. Each one of these points, I I believe, is so profound that I could just take forever, and we could all take forever letting them just sink in, and my hope is that we all just get a glimpse. Jesus is God with us. Unbelievable fact. Um, You read through the entire Bible, especially the Old Testament. Every time God shows up or even comes close, There's fear and trembling and even the weight of death. There's this great story in the Old Testament where Moses, who was so close to God, said, God, I just want to see you face to face. God said, I can't do that. If you saw me face to face, you'd die. And actually, he he kind of compromises with Moses, says, okay, I'm going to put you in this cleft of a mountain. I'll put my hand over. I'll, I'll pass by. Then I'll remove my hand. You'll see the place where I just was. And that'll blow your mind. And that's the story you find in the Old Testament is, you know, Moses gets a glimpse of his backside and is just blown away. But you go, for instance, to like a story like when the Ten Commandments are given on Mount Sinai. The entire mountain is trembling with an earthquake. There's fire that comes down. People are in awe and wonder and fear and dread and terror take over them. You can only imagine There's another place in the book of Isaiah where he gets this vision of God in heaven, seated on the throne, and he falls down and says, woe is me, I'm like a dead man. Anyway, here's the point. Throughout the entire Bible, any time God came anywhere near us, I mean, the fear, the trembling, the, the, the death, was right there. We we can't take it. Um, That's because God is holy. I I know the word holy, it's kind of a weird word. We don't use it that much, and so it just sounds churchy, so to speak. The word holy simply means this, set apart. The idea in the Bible is that God's totally set apart. He's totally different. He he is totally other compared to us. Let's talk about something. I'd like to talk about xenophobia. You know what xenophobia is? It's the fear that human beings naturally have of things that are strange or foreign, the fear of others. And I would say that probably all of us, to one degree or another, suffer from xenophobia. And um, I spent a bunch of time this week thinking about xenophobia, and I realized that xenophobia is actually a function of two different things. Uh, Thing number one is how familiar or unfamiliar something is. Thing number two is how close or distant that unfamiliar thing is. So I know that school's out, but I I made a line chart. Like, here comes math class or something. So, um, xenophobia, I think. The more familiar and unfamiliar something is, that's one, that'd be your X axis. And then you have a Y axis, fear and comfort. And here's what I'd say, the more familiar we are with something, the more comfortable we feel. Does that make sense? I mean, no matter what it is, it could be food, it could be people, it could be, you know, situations. The more familiar you are with that food, people, or situations, the more comfortable you'll be in them. Of course, the more unfamiliar you are, and here's how the function would look, the more unfamiliar you are, the more fear you may have. I mean, I know this. I served as a missionary in Africa. You find yourself in strange situations. If you don't know what's going on, you don't feel comfortable at all. I mean, you're just, at times you can even be totally afraid, and 
There may not be a reason to be afraid, but you just are because you're unfamiliar with it. So part of xenophobia is just how familiar or unfamiliar you are with something. The more unfamiliar, the more the fear. But given that you're very unfamiliar with it, it's also a function of how distant or near that unfamiliar thing is, and so your, your y-axis would be fear and comfort again, and the function would look like this. Something can be totally different or unfamiliar, as long as it's way away from you, if it's very far, uh, that's all right, you'll still feel comfort. So maybe in you know, Zimbabwe, people are doing some weird stuff. They probably are, but no one here is afraid of it because it's in Zimbabwe. But if someone all of a sudden wants to do something really weird in here, uh, you'd start to feel some amount of fear. Here, forget math class. Hey, this was on the news this weekend. Did you all see this? Did you see this? So in California, Elon Musk's company, SpaceX, sent up a rocket, and apparently a bunch of people didn't know about it. And uh, all of a sudden, people like, started filming it, started taking pictures, started posting on Twitter. They all thought it was a, a UFO. Uh, we had people like Demi Lovato, we had Zendaya tweeting. I came across, this is the rapper, Will I Am. He had this great tweet of his video taking this, and it was profound enough that I actually wrote down his quote. <laughs> Will I Am. What is that in the sky? What in the what? <laughs> Check that out on Twitter. It's there. <laughs> all right. Uh, you know, if all of a sudden you think you see a UFO and the aliens are landing, I mean, that is pretty unfamiliar. So you're going to be kind of scared, right? But as long as it stays up in the sky, you can post a video to Twitter just saying, what in the what? <laughs> but let's say that thing had taken a left turn and dove down and it's coming right at you and getting very, very close. Like, how afraid are you? You know, all of a sudden there's like a flying saucer and it's chasing you. You are very, very, very afraid. So, xenophobia the fear of strange, foreign, other, that goes up the more different someone or something is, and it goes up the closer it gets. Well, here's the reason I say all this. The Bible says God is holy, and the word holy means that he's totally, entirely other, totally different. I mean, we're humans. He's the creator of the entire world, and in the Bible, all the attributes God has, his goodness, his love, he has those attributes to the maximum. So there is nothing more other than God himself. And the idea that this holy God would be God with us, that he'd come down and be born and be a baby which you could embrace, uh, that's, that's mind-blowing. Now. Jesus is God with us. Why, why, why does the God of the universe take on human flesh to be with us? Why? And um, I guess I'd like to come at it this way. I'll just tell you, this is a story. It happens to be a story about a family member, my wife's father, how he became a Christian. My wife's father, uh, really throughout his life, has been a workaholic. It used to be that every Christmas time, uh, my wife's family would all leave and go be with their family, but he, because he was a workaholic, would stay back, stay home. Um, he just, he was too concerned about his business, and anyway, uh, one year, of course, all the family had gone away, he was by himself, and there was an accident in his workplace where someone actually got killed. And uh, he was just beside himself and forlorn. He uh, had taken a drive. He went up on this hill and was just, he was parked there. He had the radio on. And do all of you remember uh, Paul Harvey? Paul Harvey came on. And it was Christmas time, and every year Paul Harvey would do this, 
He called it the story of the birds. And um, he did it in a way I can't, but I'll give the summary. He says, this isn't a story about, you know, a Scrooge. This is a story about a kind and decent man who was generous to his family and who was a goodly person with all that he dealt with. But he just had trouble understanding this whole idea of the incarnation and this story that God would come down and take on human flesh. And he was too honest to pretend otherwise. And so when it came time that Christmas Eve for his family go, to go to church, he said, honey, I just can't. I'm sorry to disappoint you, but I just can't go through that knowing that that's absolutely just, you know, garbage. Uh, I can't wrap my mind around it, and so I, you go. Uh, I just won't participate. Here, I, there's the man. There's the family going off to church. And instead of going into the, the church, he, he himself just settled down. It was a snowy night, and so he sat down in his living room, and he had in his living room this large pane of glass. And the snowstorm was getting worse and worse. All of a sudden, he heard a thud like someone was throwing a snowball at his front window. When he got out to look to see who it was, it was actually thud, thud, thud. A flock of birds had uh, gotten disoriented in the storm, and it hit that window. They were all stunned, and they were lying there in the snow. They were trembling and afraid, and he knew if he didn't do something, that they would probably die. And so he got on his winter coat and his galoshes and he stepped outside. And uh, then he thought to himself, what will I do when he remembered that he had a barn? So he went to the barn, which was warm and cozy. He turned on the light thinking, if I turn on the light, they'll be drawn there, but they weren't. So he thought, now what will I do? He went inside, he got some food, he laid out breadcrumbs leading to the barn but uh, they were confused. They didn't know what he was doing. They weren't interested in eating, and so they remained there stunned. He got down and tried to shoo them. He was shooing the birds, but the more he, he tried to shoo them, they just became more confused, and he became exasperated, thinking to himself, what will I do? When finally it dawned on him, he said, if only I could become a bird. If only I could communicate to them in a way they'd understand then perhaps I'd save them. And Paul Harvey says, at that moment, the church bells rang. O come, all ye faithful. And he understood for the first time why God became a man and made his dwelling among us. This holy God communicating to him, communicating himself in the face of this baby boy. Oh, come all ye faithful. And as my father sat there looking over this hill, he gave his life to Christ for the first time and has never looked back. And uh, I like to tell that story, especially at Christmas time. Jesus is God with us. And there's a simple message Oh, come all ye faithful.